Okay, we'll move on to our next speaker, who is Tom Austin. Tom is currently the Land Protection Specialist for the Edisto Island Open Land Trust and one of our board members. Tom received his undergraduate de degree from Clemson in Wildlife and Fisheries Management. I think I got that right. Is that so, Tom? Wildlife and Fisheries Biology. Okay, thank you. Um, He's a, an extremely well-rounded naturalist with an interest in all walks of life and a longtime habit of gardening for butterflies and pollinators using native species. He's published an original research article in the Journal of, Lep of the Lepidopterist Society entitled <laughs> Notes on the Field Identification of the Intricate Seder. And I'm, I'm gonna mangle the genus uh, name of this, Hermeptychia intricata and its ecology in South Carolina. Tom has been a wonderfully patient mentor to me in the field on birds, butterflies, and native plants. Um, but at any rate, Tom is going to talk to us today about native plants for pollinators at the Hutchinson House. And I'm sure he's going to explain a little bit about the Hutchinson House, so I won't steal his thunder there. But this is a project that I'm happy to say was funded at least in part by a grant from CBS. Tom, it's all yours. Thank you, Allison. Um, let's see. Do I have share screen privileges? Should. I do. It's all right. So uh, I hope, so I'm here to primarily give y'all an update on the uh, butterfly garden project out there at the Hutchinson House. So I hope my title wasn't too misleading. Um, because since I, I work down here exclusively in the coastal plain of South Carolina, I figured I probably shouldn't focus too much specifically on pollinator plants because they probably won't be applicable to most of y'all. But I am going to go over all the all the highlights, everything that worked, all the successful stuff uh, that I use for growing, you know, native plant pollinator gardens down here in the Low Country of South Carolina. Um, so just real quick, uh, Allison went over most of my bio, so I'm not going to, you know spend too much time on it, but I am the land protection specialist for the Edisto Island Open Land Trust. So we're a small four person nonprofit for, um, and I do all of the, you know, GIS mapping work. I go out, monitor all the properties. I do all of the, the baseline due diligence work, environmental surveys, or not environmental surveys, ecological surveys for all of our new protected properties and do all, basically all the technical work in the background. And I also mow grass and pull weeds. So just a quick update uh, or a quick background on the Edisto Island Open Land Trust. Uh, we were founded in 1994 by some concerned residents on Edisto Island who feared that rapid commercial and industrial development was uh, making its way towards the south end of Charleston County. Uh, our mission is to preserve the rural quality of life on Edisto by protecting lands, waterways, scenic vistas, and heritage through conservation and education. Uh, we promote sustainable residential, commercial, and industrial development on the island and try and thwart and stop unsustainable development wherever we can. Uh, we're, we have a, you know, kind of single-minded focus to put as much land under acreage uh, as we can. And uh, we also want to teach Edistonians about the value of conserving our natural resources and, you know, keeping traditional land uses and not wanting to change everything so rapidly that, you know, we throw the baby out with the bathwater. At the moment, we currently steward uh, 4,108 acres of protected property on Edisto Island and in Megat. And just real quick, for everyone up in North Carolina who has no idea where I'm talking about, this is Edisto Island. We're just across St. Helens Sound from Beaufort and just south of Seabrook and Kiowa. So we're just right down there. We're about a 70 square mile uh, sea island with a couple barrier islands on the front of it. Here's a just a quick map I threw together of all the protected properties on Edisto Island. Edisto Island is, if you count the marsh, we're over 50% protected. If you don't count the marsh, we're at 44%, I think. So, but we're working real hard towards that 50% protection goal. And the Hutchinson House, if y'all can see my cursor, is this little red rectangle right down here, sort of on the eastern point of the island. So the, the Hutchinson House is kind of the, the best surviving example of Friedman architecture on Edisto Island. It was built uh, circa 1885. We're not 100% certain on the exact date. And it was a home uh, of Henry and Rosa Hutchinson. It was built by Henry uh, for his wife, Rosa, just essentially as a 
late wedding gift. They got married in 1885 and then built the house. Uh, it's a local landmark on the island. It's located prominently on the side of Point of Pines Road. Uh, and it's it's a property that's steeped in a rich history and it's tied to you know, the story of a very important family in you know just the global history of Edisto Island. So the Hutchinsons were important leaders in the African-American community on Edisto Island, both during the Civil War, as well as up through Reconstruction and on into the late 19th century. So Henry's father, uh, Jim Hutchinson, was a Civil War veteran, he was a social activist, and he was also a local politician. And he did a lot to get land into the hands of freedmen after the war. He organized essentially cooperative land acquisitions. He would get you know, 50 people together and they would pool all their money go buy a, a plantation that was being foreclosed on, get 500 acres, and then, you know, split it up into 10 acre lots for, you know, all 50 people. He did that a couple of times, and that's how he uh, got a hold of his little 30 acre parcel uh, where the Hutchinson house stands today. Um, Henry Hutchinson built his house in 1885, sort of next door to where there was a pre-existing cotton gin and an old plantation house. His brother lived in the old plantation house. And he built his house on the other side of the cotton gin from him. And then he actually ran a farming co-op. And so he owned and operated his own cotton gin and he de dealt directly with a factor in Charleston who bought all of his Sea Island cotton. And in exchange for that, he would give him an upfront loan so that he could buy seed, advisor, stuff like that. On the front end and so all of his neighbors would essentially take their cotton to jim or henry henry would gin it all sell it to the factor he'd get a big loan for all of the cotton and then he would distribute that you know proportionately to everyone who had you know brought him cotton for ginning and this allowed them to through economy of scale get much higher prices per pound for cotton they also avoided any potential middleman uh action with you know white owned gin el gins elsewhere on the island and it helped him you know, it helped his small local enclave uh, in the, that corner of Edisto Island really maximize the profit and, you know, earn, you know, a living wage after the war without being dependent or sharecropping with anybody. Uh, and his daughter Lula was also important on the island because she was a school teacher on Edisto Island. Both her and her husband were school teachers and they taught for over 50 years on the island. So she, she taught at least two full generations of students uh, on Edisto Island. And one question that we get a lot and we ask ourselves fairly regularly is why do we own this house to begin with? Because we're, we're a land conservation organization. If you recall from our mission, we don't, historic preservation is nowhere in there. Uh, and it just so happened to be that we were in the right place at the right time and we were able to upfront the money and buy the house off the open market and prevent it from being bought by some random person, demolished, and all the history lost, destroyed, and forgotten. So we were able to go get a short-term $100,000 loan from the Coastal Community Fund, buy the property, and then fundraise, and then pay off the purchase a year later. And so we just happened to be in the right place at the right time, and so we stepped in to buy the property, put some protections on it, and just hold on to it to see if somebody else would want to do the restoration. But we ended up doing the restoration ourselves. And at the moment, you see the photo down there at the bottom. That's our the current status of the house. We are halfway through the restoration. We've done the initial, we've done all the stabilization and the initial skin, if you will, but we haven't touched the interior at all. And we have not put the original wraparound porches back onto the house. Um, however, we just finished fundraising and we now have all the money we need to do the you know major construction renovation to the house. So that just happened the end of last year. So we're gonna be moving hard and fast on that. Hopefully within the next two years, it'll be done. So um, we are a land trust though. So we've got to work some kind of environmental education into it if we do indeed open this as a you know historical interpretive park. You know, the Hutchinson House is a significant cultural project and landmark for the island. But again, our mission is not historic preservation. Um, we're happy to do the work. It's allowing us to reach, you know, all different um, corners of the community that we've never been able to really, you know, work with and communicate with and, you know, communicate environmental education stuff to before. You know, it's allowing us to reach people all across the state, both as well as nationally and internationally. It's been a fantastic project for us to work on. Um, 
But we also need to remember what our core of what we're doing. So we're working uh, environmental education stuff into the property. And we're also trying, hoping to do some habitat management on the, you know, the 18 acres we have out there. Um, so what I'm here to do today is to give you a, an update on one of those small little facets of that, you know, environmental interpretation that we're doing out there. Um, and so just to orient y'all, this here is a map of the property. It's 18 acres. And everything you see here in yellow that I have highlighted are old field habitats. Uh, most of the property is old fields as well as some young mixed forest. This was all fields up until the 90s, uh, actively worked agricultural fields. So at the moment, there's just sort of some scraggly scrub and trees. There's a fair bit of Chinese privet out there too, and it needs some cleaning up. But the fields out there are actually in excellent shape. Uh, at the moment, we have some trails open to the public, so it is publicly accessible. If anyone finds themselves down there on the island, you can come out there, walk around the property, and come visit the garden I'm going to show you about uh, here in a second. Um, additionally, uh, before I forget, uh, the, we have two parcels there. The first one we purchased ourselves through fundraising, uh, donations, and such. And the second we were able to purchase with Charleston County Greenbelt funding, and that allowed us to apply for a grant and just purchase the second par parcel outright which the same Hutchinson relative put up on the market. And we had a donor step forward and just buy the property outright, hold on to it. And then we were able to go get grant funding, come back and then pay her back at cost and buy the property from her. So we didn't have to worry about that getting sold on the market either. Um, the, the old field habitats that are out there on the property are, are kind of the, the standout feature uh, ecologically about the whole property. Um, I like to call them wildflower meadows. You can call them grasslands as well, but there's actually not that many grasses. The, the real technical habitat term is just old fields. And that's what they really truly are. Um, but what makes them so nice out there at this property is that they are just dominated by perennial forbs that are just awesome pollinator plants. We have done nothing except bush hog it maybe two or three times. And the fields are just spectacular. It's almost entirely like, late summer, early fall, uh, blooming species out there, but around, I think mid-September to the beginning of October, it's just stunning out there. Um, there's re there's seven plants that make up, you know, like probably about 90% of the plants out there. And that's tall goldenrod, spotted bee balm, Spanish needles, common ragweed, a uh, couple species of blue stems, uh, camper weed, as well as, hmm, mainly one species of North American aster, but there's a couple other ones mixed in there as well. And everything except for the, the ragweed and the Spanish needles, or sorry, the ragweed and the blue stems are just awesome pollinator plants. And they are just as thick as can be out there. Um, it's, it's really a sight to see. Um, it's not so good for the butterflies, but just the bees and the wasps and the pollinating flies and stuff. It's just a haze. Um, so, the thing I want to do out there is I want to create a little oasis, uh, a native plant pollinator garden in the middle of this meadow that, you know, is, is focused on, you know, showy native plants that I can interpret and demonstrate to visitors and teach them about the importance of pollinator garden and the importance of pollinators and how they can get out there and do pollinator garden themselves. And also draw in all the big, beautiful, showy butterflies who will come right to this little oasis that's got all the host plants and all the neck, all the best nectar plants and all that stuff. And they'll just, you know, really be a centerpiece there that I can just base all of the interpretation around out of the site. Um, and the goal, the goal is to use mostly native plants, uh, but I am also going to use some naturalized exotics that are kind of unique to Edisto Island or just such great pollinator plants that you really, you'd be ashamed not to use them. Uh, I'll get into, you know, the ones I actually did pick and use and all that. It was only, I think, two, two U.S. natives that are adventitious, you know, colonizers of South Carolina, and then yes. one other exotic species that's non-invasive, uh, and I'll touch on those later, but the focus is on uh, butterfly habitat. Uh, I want to get as many larval hosts in there as possible, but also provide, you know, as many great nectar choices uh, that bloom, you know, throughout the year. Because uh, as I said, the meadows are primarily uh, like late summer, fall species that are blooming and providing nectar. So the more spring and midsummer species I can provide 
the more, the more butterflies I'm going to get coming in there, you know, at different times of the year, and I'm going to have higher concentrations all throughout the year. Uh, but I also don't want to forget about, you know, our native bees and wasps. Um, so I've got a lot of plants that die and leave dry stems so that, you know, minor bees and um, uh, mason wasps and stuff like that have places to nest, uh, as well as I also leave up all of the, the dead debris as long as possible in the spring so that there's a place for birds to come in and forage for seeds and, and hide and have cover, as well as mice and other, you know, meadow, small mammal, mammal species to come in and utilize. And, you know, uh, also an another thing with the way I garden is I try and make it as natural as possible. One, because I'm just really lazy and I don't like to spend all the time cleaning up the place. Uh, and two, because if you emulate a natural setting, you're going to have more natural wildlife. It's just, it's just a fact. Uh, if I spend all the time cleaning it up and mulching and all this stuff, I'm not going to have the same amount of cover. I'm not going to have the places for, you know, minor bees and stuff like that to nest. I'm not going to have, you know, birds and mice and other things coming in there. And I'm also going to get more weeds coming up, you know, earlier in the season because they get light sooner, they get warmer sooner and all that stuff. But primarily I'm just lazy. Um, and so this garden uh, was funded primarily by the Carolina Butterfly Society. I got a $600 grant and that grant paid for all the materials, all the irrigation, all, all of the, you know, growing media, all of that stuff. And then I also got a $400 grant from the Low Country chapter of the South Carolina Native Plant Society. My original plan was to, to wheel and deal and work all my connections and network and get as many plants and divisions and seeds for free as I possibly could. And then COVID happened, so I couldn't do any of that. So I went out and got a secondary complimentary grant from the Low Country Native Plant Society. They got me $400 and that paid for all of my plants and seeds that I couldn't steal from my neighbors uh, you know, by myself for free. And also the Edison Island Open Land Trust funded it as well because they pay my salary and they let me do it. So, you know, they're also a major supporter of the project. The general construction of the garden is uh, 16, uh, four foot wide, or sorry, four 16 foot long, four foot wide raised beds. Uh, they're up to nine inches tall. I didn't fill them, you know, that are that deep with a uh, growing media. Um, it's just a wood, wood frame. It's about half treated, half untreated. I've never had an issue with treated lumber in my gardens. It's, you probably don't want to use the really old arsenic soak stuff for like growing vegetables, but the, the newer modern stuff, if you're just growing a pollinator garden, it's not a concern at all. Um, I've got it set up with a timed irrigation system using soaker hose, and I'm also using the lasagna gardening approach. Uh, one, because that better emulates natural soils. Uh, and also, again, I'm lazy. So I don't have to till the soil, I don't have to work the soil. Uh, I just keep adding organic matter to it. And as long as I have a healthy surrounding ecosystem of soil microbes, they will come into the garden and they will work the soil up and down and till it all in and get all the organic matter and nutrients you know, mixed down in there and cycled and aerated and all that stuff. Uh, so in the future, I'm just going, I'm not doing like a true lasagna gardening. I'm not adding direct organic material and letting it compost naturally in the beds. I'm more so adding like pre-composted material just because of, you know, I don't have a ready supply of organic material out there that's, you know, not full of weed seeds. Um, but in a true lasagna gardening, you would be adding like leaf litter and like green manure and brown manure, just, you know, pine straw and stuff like that to it. And this, I'm just adding compost regularly and then not disturbing the soil as much as possible. Uh, at the moment, I'm doing weed control entirely by hand by mechanical removal. Um, in the future, I'm probably going to start using mulch strategically as well as like targeted herbicide applications for the really nasty weeds, specifically yellow nut sedge, because you just cannot remove that stuff mechanically. Uh, if you do remove it mechanically, it actually makes it worse. So that one, you either have to just mulch the snot out of it, which is not great for, you know, volunteer annuals or um, you just have to use one of the specialty sedge specific herbicides and just attack it, you know, once a year and to just keep its numbers low enough that it doesn't run, run out, take over the place. Um, uh, my general strategy with plant selection is I wanted to use plants that were common to Edisto Island because I wanted people to come to the garden, people who lived on the island and go, I've seen that, that grows on the side of the road next to my house and be able to finally put a name to a plant um, rather than me going out and planting a bunch of stuff that you can't find on the island anywhere. And so people see it and go, oh, okay. I wanted people to be able to recognize the plant, see them, know what their value is, see what they can do. And, you know, go out there and 
snitch seeds off the side of the roads and start planting stuff in, you know, on their property and getting a lot more pollinator habitat all around the island. And I also wanted everything in there to have some kind of pollinator use, unless it really had like a specific historical, like interpretive bent that I could, I could use on top of it, giving some pollinator use. The, the goal is to maximize, you know, pollinator potential as well as minimize, you know, actual workload and tending of the garden. Um, I also deliberately arranged uh, plant selections in the beds. So I would have one bed that would only have like dryland plants, another bed that was only wetland plants, another one that was plants that like mo moist soil and another one that was plants that, you know, didn't really care. They just like regular normal garden soil. And I also staggered their heights as well. Um, so I planted all the really tall stuff in the back and all the really short stuff in the front. Uh, or if strategically I would mix and match, if I had something that really needed partial shade, I'd plant it on the east side of some really tall thing in the back so that it would only get morning sun and then it would get, you know, totally shaded out in the afternoon, that sort of thing. Um, just, just because I have a lot of spare time in the winter uh, here at the office. So I had lots of time to think about it and plan and strategize. Uh, and I also wanted to, to pick plants that complemented the composition of the meadow. It kind of didn't make sense because I've got a lot of great plants growing out there in the meadow, but what's the point of putting two spotted bee balm in the middle of the garden when there is literally four acres of the stuff solid behind me? It's not going to draw, draw in pollinators. It's not going to complement the habitat. So I wanted to plant things that weren't already growing in mass quantities out at the site in the garden so, so as to, to maximize the benefit to the surrounding pollinator community, get more stuff into the garden, have you know, the highest diversity of pollinators possible in the garden to help interpret. Uh, and you know, again, I wanted to create an oasis of novel habitat in the middle of the, of the, the meadow rather than bring the meadow into the garden. So just to prime you all, this is a selection of some of the plants I used. So I'll go into all these in more detail, but I was trying to diversify, you know, not only planting time, but also plant color and plant shape and size and everything, run the whole gambit, um, just get as much stuff as I possibly could. And Here's the final layout that I ended up having. Everything here in yellow is stuff that I grew from seed and I either grew it in a plug or I direct sowed it in the bed. And everything in green was something that I either got a division or a rooted cutting or I bought a plug someplace or I had a pot sitting in my backyard that I forgot about four years ago. And this is what I ended up putting out in there. Um, so just to run through them real quick, uh, the far west bed, bed number one, this was the dry bed. So I, I put plants in here that needed the least amount of watering. And the initial strategy was I had um, ball valves on the irrigation system at every single bed. And I was going to be able to, to turn off the ball valve and water things at different cycles. That ended up not happening because again, I'm lazy. So I just watered everything the same amount and it worked out for the most part. But in the future, I might be able to get like multiple automatic irrigation uh, timers and put them in line in the irrigation system and be able to get different irrigation regimes on different beds at different times of year and all that stuff. But I just didn't get to that, that point of complexity this year. And in bed one, I had Indian blanket, guardia, uh, American wild carrot, Indian grass, woodland phlox, butterfly weed, rabbit tobacco, and sickle pod. Bed two was the wetland bed. I had frog fruit, powdery alligator flag, cannas, scarlet rose mallow, um, gladiolus dolini, that's an interesting one I'll, I'll touch on, golden alexander, blue mist flower, spider wart, uh, stokes aster, dense blazing star, common cell feel, and the eucalypt plant. Bed three was the moist bed. I had golden mane coreopsis, chapula river coreopsis, yarrow, swamp milkweed, Elliot's aster, and muck sunflower. And bed four was the just sort of medium, you know, well-irrigated, um, well-drained bed. I'm going to lay out for the garden, <laughs> all the different. That had scarlet sage, lyre leaf sage, coral bean, Carolina indigo, Guatemalan indigo, lance leaf coreopsis, black-eyed Susan, frostweed, hairy leaf cup, and some Joe pie weed. And just to go quickly through the progress or, uh, and, you know, know, when all of this stuff happened, I first conceived of this this, this plan back in February of 2019, 
Um, on, in January of 2021, I started uh, work out in the field. I went out there, uh, cut down about a 50 by 50 area of the meadow, uh, put in corner stakes, measured out all of the whole area that I was going to convert into a garden. Then I went out and that same day dug footers for the inboards. Uh, the following week, I came out there, put inboards on all the footers, and then cut all of the sideboards to length. Um, put in central footers to mount those sideboards to for st stability. Got all that cut, trimmed, and screwed together. Then I put down um, cardboard. And oh, and all of the lumber I got for free from the land trust because we had just, fin just finished pulling down all of the stabilization belts and scaffolding off of the Hutchinson house. So I was able to take all of that, that salvaged lumber and just carry it right on over the field. And I stacked it up there for about a year and I was able to take that and build the bed without having to buy any lumber at all. I just had to buy some screws. So that was fantastic. That saved me probably $200, especially with lumber prices uh, during COVID. Um, uh, then I put down cardboard as a, as a um, biodegradable weed barrier. Uh, if you do this in your garden, make sure not to use the like plasticized, like wax printed cardboard, just get like pizza boxes and the stuff that a washer or dryer comes in that just, regular, um, you know, the kind of cardboard you don't want to accidentally leave out in the rain because it just turns to mush. That's the best kind to use. Uh, the thicker, the better. And I put that down underneath all the beds. And then um, all seasons, um, landscaping supplies from John's Island came and delivered compost. I bought five yards of, of their high quality mushroom compost. And I think they brought me eight, which was awesome. I ended up putting about four or five inches thick of compost in every single bed. And then I took another yard home back to my house and filled up all of my pots. It was awesome. Um, uh, got that all spread. I had a couple of volunteers showed up. We knocked it out in about 30 minutes. Uh, then I put down just some regular 10, 10, 10 fertilizer uh, in February. And then I also put down some calcium sulfate in the form of dental mold castings. That's the upside of having a, a mom who works for an orthodontist office. I get all the plaster repairs I could ever want. Uh, it's a great slow release calcium and sulfur uh, soil amendment. Uh, it's also pH neutral, so it's not going to mess with your pH, although I would, with the or acidic soils, I would like it to be somewhat alkaline, but you know, it's free. So I use that pretty much all my gardens down here in the coastal plain. We're usually sulfur limited in some capacity, so it always adds just a nice boost at the start to all the plants can get the roots established and get down into the subsoil and actually be able to pull up, you know, sulfates. Then I put in a deer fence. I used, um, I drove eight foot T posts on all the corners, as well as a sort of six foot section in the middle, or I think eight foot section for a gate. And then I ran 30 pound test monofilament and in eight inch increments the whole way around to create a deer fence. Uh, the upside of using monofilament is it's incredibly cheap. It costs like $5 for the roll of, of fish in line. Um, it takes like 30 minutes to put up. And the principle behind that is that in low light conditions, the deer cannot see the fence and they walk into it and they cannot discern a top and they cannot discern a bottom and it confuses them. And if they're not extremely motivated, they won't jump into the garden. If, if you're growing like nothing but black oil sunflowers or something, they will just run through it you know, you can't stop a hundred pound deer with 30 pound test, but if they don't really want to get in there and we have so much great habitat out there at the property, I did not have a single problem with deer the whole year, which was mind boggling. I thought they were just going to run straight through the thing. Uh, in future years, I'm going to switch from monofilament to 17 gauge electric fence wire. I'm not going to electrify it, but I'm going to use steel wire just because the monofilament due to UV only lasts about a year. Uh, and it's just a lot of monofilament I've got to dispose of afterwards. So I'm going to switch to 17 gauge steel wire afterwards. It'll be a little bit more resilient and should last, you know, forever. Um, well, five, 10 years. It's a bit more expensive though. It's about $30 for half mile roll. Um, then I also put in a swing gate just so I could get in and out of there. Left it wide enough. I could get a lawnmower or a wheelbarrow through. I also put in a B motel. Uh, and I think within a week I had my, I had, um, uh, Mason wasps utilizing the bee motel. So there was, there was a need out there for habitat. Uh, then I started uh, getting my seeds ready. And then I put in the irrigation system. Um, I have a shallow well situated about 75 feet from the garden. So I was able to just run a hundred foot garden hose from that. I eventually buried that in conduit that ran up to a, a, um, 
a uh, spigot I put into one of the fence posts uh, holding up the gate. And then off of that, I ran a 45 degree valve splitter down to a vacuum breaker, to a flushable filter, to a timer, then to a polytube starter. And then that runs polytubing over to all four of the beds. I have a manifold on bed three that allows me to shut off water to beds one and two, three and four. And then at each one of the beds, I just drilled a hole right through the, the inboard and just poked a barb through and then just hooked up 25 foot of um, soaker hose per bed. Uh, one, one quirk of this system is uh, I forgot to, to plumb uh, beds one and two so that I could individually shut off one and two. I just have it so I shut off one and two or just one. I need to fix that at some point, but I just haven't. It's worked out well so far, but it's a simple fix. On the 27th, uh, the Low Country chapter, the South Carolina Native Plant Society had their native plant sale down at Charlestown Landing. So I went down there and bought a whole bunch of plants. There was a lot of stuff I wasn't able to get. I wasn't able to get any milkweed from them. They were sold out like a, like first thing in the morning. First person who came in bought everything. Uh, so that there was a couple of things I missed that I had to go scrounge around and find replacements for at the last minute. But I got a lot of a lot of stuff, but not all the really critical things I needed. And by August 20th, I had all the plants in the ground. I had all the seeds direct sowed. I think I'd sowed seeds a little bit earlier in March. And by April 26th, I had monarchs. Um, I think actually the week after I put uh, milkweed in the ground, I had monarchs and it was kind of a, 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 a not good situation because all my monarch or all my milkweed was about two inches tall and I had 12 monarchs on them. Uh, but thankfully I did get some larger pots and I was able to transplant all of the, the second instar uh, monarch caterpillars over onto the larger milkweed. And then they, they stripped that plant bare, uh, but they grew to full size and they went off and pupated and did their thing. And I have no idea if they survived or not, but I never saw them again. Um, but that really hurt my milkweed for the rest of the year because immediately after the, the monarchs finished with them, the aphids just hit them and using, you know, contact soap, vinegar, isopropyl alcohol sprays to control the aphids, just, it barely put a dent into them. They'd be back in three, four days. Um, but I'm hoping my milkweed should come back around after being in the ground for a year this after, you know, having a, the rest of the year to grow and mature. I had our second butterfly, or at least the first one I confirmed was fully grown in the garden on May 19th. We had a, I just so happened to walk up on a Brazilian skipper that had eclosed from the powdery alligator, alligator flag, flag I had transplanted. Um, I think that one's kind of cheating because I think it was on there when I moved the thing. So I guess I transplanted the caterpillar in there and the plant lived long enough that the caterpillar didn't die. Uh, but that's cool, cool caterpillar to get. Uh, that's why I put that plant in there uh, down here on Edisto Island. Uh, powdery alligator flag uh, grows wild in a lot of places and they're just covered in Brazilian skippers. We never get cold enough to kill them off, um, especially in the wetlands. Uh, just down here, May 21st, that's how the garden looked. And you can see the um, gold mane coreopsis blooming. Everything else is, you know, coming out pretty well. Um, then on June 30th, you can see we've got a couple of things blooming. I think the um, cannas are blooming and the um, dragon's head sword lilies are blooming. Everything else is leafing out, starting to grow. I think the hairy leaf cup might be starting to grow. And then I've sort of got a close up of them uh, back in at the end of July. Guardia is in full bloom. The sickle pod is fully grown. Cannas are still going. The scarlet rose mallow is growing. The yarrow is blooming, uh, the um, scarlet sage, as well as the um, black-eyed Susans are blooming along with the hairy leaf cup. And then down here in October, you can see those meadows in the background. You can see all the goldenrod and all that stuff, uh, as well as the, um, the spot of bee balm just a little bit there on the left. But I've got the Indian grass blooming on the far side, the cannas blooming there in bed too. The sunflowers are almost in full bloom. And then I've got the frost weed going full tilt in the other bed. And then this last one from the third week of October, you can just see the muck sunflowers in their full glory. So here's a quick just summary of how everything actually did. Everything in, in green did great, no problems. Everything in yellow kind of struggled and everything in orange just really did not do well. Um, Guardia did, you know, just fine, no problem. Um, actually, I've got a little bit more in-depth details on that. 
Um, the American wild carrot, I think I just planted it too late. I think they tend to germinate in like late, uh, late fall, uh, early winter. And I put them in the ground in April, just direct. So, and so they just got in the ground too late. They weren't able to mature and flower in time. Uh, but I think they will act as biennials if they germinate late. So I'm hoping I got a, a good patch of them that came up, but they just never flowered. So I'm hoping they'll do good this year and start self-seeding. Uh, the woodland flocks, I wanted thick leaf flocks, but I could only find woodland flocks when I went out to actually get plants. And it's just not well adapted to the site conditions. Uh, it, it's just too hot and it gets too much sun. It did well until July happened and then it just got nuked just by the solar radiation. Um, so I, I think it'll come back, but I think I need to move it someplace where it's in deep shade, like behind one of the other larger plants. Uh, my butterfly weed did not do well. I think it was probably because of the irrigation. Uh, it was getting well irrigated. Uh, also, um, I had a volunteer give me a bunch of milkweed plants. She thought she was giving me butterfly weed. She accidentally gave me uh, swamp milkweed, which wasn't bad. I needed that, but I just put it in the wrong spot. Uh, so I really only had one butterfly weed come up and it did pretty well. It got about uh, 18 inches tall and then it just croaked. So I think it just ended up getting too much water. Um, and I also have had really horrible luck getting butterfly weed seeds to start. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. I'm going to have to ask Dennis about that, I guess. Uh, but I've maybe only had three plants ever come up for me out of like 200 seeds I've planted. And I don't, I don't know what it is that I'm doing wrong. I've tried all different kinds of soils and substrates and water regimes and whatnot. Um, and then when they do come up, the monarchs find them instantly and kill them. So I think I just need to get a greenhouse, I guess. Um, uh, the frog fruit I got surprisingly had really low vigor. Like I've, I've always said that you can't kill frog fruit. It'll grow on asphalt. It'll grow on your roof if you let it. Um, but for some reason I had one of mine croak and I don't know what that was about. And it took the plants months to finally get started. I think they just need time to establish. I think they just needed to be hardened off and they didn't quite get hardened correctly. Um, but I, they did. They turned around by the by the fall, so I'm hoping they'll do well this year. Uh, the powdery alligator flag uh, just didn't do it. Its soil wasn't wet enough. Um, without me going in and modifying the substrate, putting in a pond liner or something, I don't think I'm ever going to be able to grow it. I kind of expected that, but I was taking a shot in the dark. I got the stuff for free. Um, so that one that one grows in basically soupy soil. So that, I knew that probably wasn't going to work. Uh, the scarlet rose mallow that was sort of just. A random shot in the dark. I got the plants for free, so I put them in. They're mostly native. Um, I think I think they they didn't get very tall. They only got about three foot tall and put out one flower. I think they just need more time to establish and build up the root system. I think they were a little root bound when they got planted. Um, the golden Alexander was probably the biggest disappointment out of the bunch. It just it's not designed to grow in coastal South Carolina. Well, in essentially what amounts to like USDA hardiness zone eight B. It just, as soon as August rolled around, it just shriveled up into jerky and died. Um, so I need to find some kind of alternative for that. Uh, blue mist flower didn't do well, and it was because I was accidentally given wild azuratum, which does not do so well in the full heat sun. It needs more partial shade than blue mist flower. Uh, so it, the two look incredibly similar. And I was wondering why it was starting to bloom in uh, June. And then I realized it was azuratum and not blue mist flower. So I just need to go dig up some mist flower from someplace and swap that out. Um, my obedient plant did not do well either. I think the, the division I got, the plant was just kind of sickly and I didn't get enough of the, the root ball. So I really only had like one little plug come up in a four foot area and then the weeds just swallowed it up. So I think I just need to get some more divisions and really weed that place and get a whole bunch of stuff established earlier in the year so that they all come up and can weed suppress and fill up the area. Uh, the Chapula River Coreopsis is one I've never grown before. Um, it had unexpectedly low vigor. I, I just don't, I think it doesn't like the full heat or it might need more water or something. I got to do a little bit more research on that one. Um, the liar leaf sage I got, I think again, that one just got planted a little late, so it wasn't able to fully establish. Hopefully in the future, it'll be able to, you know, overwinter and then come out bloom early in, in fall and be able to self seed and fill up its area. And the Carolina indigo I had, um, it just got overshaded by everything around it. And I think the soil might be a little bit too moist. So I need to move it over to the dry bed. I think they like really sandy, well-drained soils. 
So the, the things I learned uh, from this year is that the weeds are going to be a nonstop issue and require a lot more aggressive control. Um, I was not able to get that out there and weed as much as I wanted. Uh, I'm, automated irrigation is a must. I switched over to an automated irrigation timer. I was using a mechanical one it, uh, initially, and that worked so much better uh, because I just got swamped at the office for like five months straight and could not get out there. Um, I also need to respect the hot hardiness and shade tolerance plants. I was playing fast and loose on a couple of things and um, it, I kind of got burnt on them. So I just need to be a little bit more careful with that and not take as many chances on whether or not something will do in the site conditions. Um, uh, also perennials are preferred whenever possible. I had a couple annual plants that came and flowered, did awesome and then died, you know, midsummer. And the whole thing just got covered in weeds. I had nothing to come in after them. So I need to have a perennial pretty much everywhere. Or if it's an annual, it needs to be something that's a late maturing like frost kill plant so that it can, you know, really suppress weeds where it's coming up. Um, also, I learned the garden just because of my soils, I just can't support high, like high soil water demand plants like the, the powdery alligator flag stuff that needs saturated soil. Um, so I, I can support plants that need, I actually have a fairly high water table at the site, even though I have really well-drained sandy soils. So anything that can establish a tap root can reach soil water, but, and also the soil holds onto water really well too. That's really excellent soil out there at the site. I haven't seen anything better in the coastal plain. Um, but I just, I, I don't have enough clay in the soil to really like form, to develop saturated soils for the plants that require that. Um, and I also learned that I, I, I should never start a garden in the middle of a field without at least putting down some kind of pre-emergent like a couple months ahead of time because I was having just weeds come up like crazy through the, through the cardboard and through six inches of compost. So I just need to get something down just to suppress like initially starting a garden to use some kind of pre-emergent. Uh, it's it's worth the, the cost of investment. Um, uh, specifically only for raised beds though. You don't want to use that when you're tilling the soil because then if you're direct sowing, your plants won't come up uh, unless you wait a long time. And then by that time, the weeds will come up anyway. Um, the plans for 2022 are to put down some fabric in the alleys, uh, as well as get some cypress mulch to put down uh, in between all of the beds, as well as just a, about an inch layer on top of the beds for a little bit of weed control, uh, as well as to keep water into the actual soil media, because I'm losing like the top inch of compost because it's drying out. So I need to get some mulch on top of it just to you know help lock the water in by keeping the sun off. Um, I'm also going uh, like I said, I'm going to replace the monofilament deer fence with 17 gauge wire. Uh, I'm going to develop and install some signage out there for, you know, visitors to look at interpretive signage as well as, you know, grant signifying signage because I don't have anything out there for saying what the thing even is or who funded it or what. Um, I'm going to need to just better control the weed growth in the beds. I just need to stay on top of it. I need to cultivate, pun intended, a local volunteer park program to maintain the garden because it was just me and one of the really good volunteer and I just need like four people out there who can just come out once a month or once or twice a month and help weed. Um, and it takes like an hour per bed to weed that thing. The weeds are just thick. They're like this all the way through. If, if there's, if you don't have something growing over the top of the soil um, and also need to plant new plants in all the vacancies that opened up and where everything didn't do well. So right here, if y'all just want to take like a quick screenshot or something like that, these are just sort of the selected plants that I grew in the garden that did really well, that will probably do really well in your garden if you also live down here on the coast where it's hot and you don't ever get snow or hard freeze, except maybe once every other year. Um, th this is stuff that does just excellent in any low country garden. Uh, a lot of this stuff is weedy. So if you like really nice, neat, maintained gardens and you don't want things that spread, don't take any advice from me because I, I recommend the most aggressive spready plants possible because they will just outcompete weeds. You can plant them anywhere and they're just no mess, no fuss. They'll just grow on their own in the worst possible conditions with no TLC. That, that's kind of my MO whenever I make a garden is to just make it to create not a garden, but a pocket of habitat for a specific plant so that it can come out, come up and just sort of subsist perpetually with only a little bit of weeding and maybe a little bit of like compost or fertilizer every couple of years. And I'm going to go through just each of the plants real quick. I know I'm running out of time, so I'm going to be as fast as I can. Um, 
Indian blanket is one that I put in any garden. It'll grow practically anywhere, super drought tolerant. It blooms year round down here in on Edisto. It never dies. It's some of it's an annual, some of it's a biennial, some of it's a perennial. It blooms literally year round. It never stops. Um, it's got a beautiful red inch and a quarter flower. It's not the best nectar plant, honestly. I see very few things on it, but some stuff does use it. Uh, it's also a good volunteer too. So it'll, if you've got some barren place where nothing really grows, you can usually put Gardia there and it'll just sort of fill up the area. And it just, it looks nice. It's a good space filler. It doesn't get big. It doesn't really crowd anything out. American wild carrot. Um, this is native to the South Carolina, South Carolina and the North Carolina coast. It's a biennial to an annual. It's about 18 inches tall, flowers in spring. It's got umble little tiny white flowers. Prefers loose sandy soil, tolerates drought really well, and it's a host plant for the black swallowtail. It's one of the few like native plants I can get down here on the extreme coast that is a black swallowtail native and or host plant and is also a native plant. There's a lot of like you know herbs and vegetables and stuff like that I can grow for black swallowtails, but there's very few things that are native that will grow on my sort of well-drained sandy soils. Uh, that'll host a black salt here. There's some stuff that you can get like wetland plants, but I, they're just not a good candidate for my site. Uh, butterfly weed. Uh, I'm not going to talk too much about that because Dennis already talked about it um, but in much more detail than I did, uh, but it grows on dry sandy soils. It's extremely drought tolerant. It's a host plant for monarchs. It is an absolutely fantastic nectar plant. Um, just if you can grow it, grow it. Uh, rabbit tobacco. Uh, this is a sort of just a weedy field plant that's native to all of South Carolina and North Carolina. It, it's an annual, but it germinates in fall and overwinters and then blooms in late summer and then dies. So it's kind of got a weird life cycle. Um, it's about two foot tall, flowers in early fall. It's got a disorganized cluster of white kind of scraggly looking flowers. They look like a little, little like hard boiled egg with the top knocked off. They're like white egg shaped with a yellow top. They'll grow practically anywhere, uh, and they're the host plant for the American lady. Um, sickle pod, another weedy field plant, but uh, it's fantastic for a couple select species. It's native to South Carolina and East North Carolina. Some people consider it a noxious weed. I think its nativity is a little up for debate, kind of like how, um, uh, what is it? Uh, uh, I forgot the plant now. Anyway, uh, coffee weed. Um, but far as I can tell, it's native, at least somewhat, to South Carolina. I think it's kind of spread all over the place, though. Uh, gets three to five foot tall, um, flowers in uh, August and September, grows practically everywhere. It's a decent nectar plant, and it's the host plant for the cloud of sulfur and the, old, and the sleepy orange uh, caterpillar. It's also a great volunteer, too. It'll come back year after year. It'll spread, too. Frog fruit is a great plant. It's actually a lawn alternative. If you've got a moist lawn somewhere, you can replace your grass with this. Well, good luck getting rid of the grass, but you can put the mix this into your lawn and actually have, you know, a forb growing in your yard that is a fantastic pollinator plant. That's perennial ground cover, uh, flowers in the spring and summer. It's got a tiny spike of pinkish white flowers, grows practically everywhere. It will tolerate salt too. Uh, it's a great nectar plant, especially for small like bees or honeybees, um, small wasps, tiny butterflies, skippers and stuff. They love this stuff. And it's also the host plant for the Phaeon Crescent and the white peacock, although we don't really have any hosting white peacocks here. Um, uh, powdery alligator flag. This one is a rare native to, South, to the South Carolina coast. Uh, interestingly, it grows in several places all around Edisto Island. It's one of the few like nucleuses uh, in the state that I'm aware of where this stuff grows wild. Um, it's perennial, gets up to about six foot tall, looks a lot like a canna, flowers in spring and summer. It's got these long powdery white bluish purple stalks, with little three quarter half inch magenta flowers on it that mature into these sort of hard nutlets. It's a really interesting plant, it, but it needs saturated soils. It'll grow on a pond edge, it'll grow in the bottom of a swale, it'll grow in a swamp. Um, it's an okay nectar plant. It's not, not the best uh, for, for the size. It doesn't put out a lot of nectar. And it's also the host plant for the Brazilian skipper. Dragon's Head Sword Lily is an interesting one. This is not a native. This is a naturalized exotic that's found extensively on Edisto Island and in Megat. Um, it's a perennial plant. It's about three foot tall. Um, flowers in May. It's got a, a tall spike of one and a half inch flowers that are just this bright, fiery orange and yellow variegation, or I guess more brindling. 
it'll grow literally anywhere. Um, it only blooms on wet soils, but you can find it growing on top of sand hills. You can find it growing in, on the edges of swamps, find it growing in ditches, on the highway edge, in swales, uh, anywhere. It'll, it'll grow anywhere. Um, it spreads too, but it's kind of like um, Narcissus. It's not invasive. It doesn't really displace anything. It's got a very small footprint. It just sort of pops up. It's got a little tiny fan and a little flower stalk, and it lasts about through late summer and then dies back. Um, and you can use it to, to fill in places all around your garden. Um, it's, it's a decent nectar plant. It's better for hummingbirds than really anything else, that big butterflies. Um, and it, it's a great addition to for kind of in a wetland garden because you can put it amongst everything else, mix it in with like Adamasco lily and stuff like that. And, you know, put it beneath cannas and stuff so it can just fill up kind of the space because a lot of those larger wetland plants kind of leave a lot of open area and you can sort of pack this in between everything and it doesn't doesn't use up a lot of resources, it doesn't crowd anything out and it, you know, and, you know, if you don't like it, you can just grab it by the stock and pull the thing straight up and compost it if you want to. Uh, blue mist flower is a great one native to all of South Carolina and North Carolina. It's perennial. It's about three foot tall. Uh, flowers in early fall. It's got an umbel of quarter inch, just sort of bright blue neon magenta flowers. Um, grows on moist soil. It likes partial shade. I like to say it kind of grows in sort of an ecotone between forest, wetlands, and like open areas. And you'll find it just sort of on the corner where all three of these habitats meet. And you get a wide diversity of butterflies in the natural environment and other pollinators that come to it because it's this sort of plant located right at the corner of three other habitats. So you'll got to get a lot of really interesting mix mixes of pollinators on it that you normally wouldn't see together because this thing grows just on the edges of where all those things are found. It's also, and yeah, it's a great nectar plant too. Obedient plant, that's another good one, native throughout South Carolina and North Carolina. It's perennial, it's about two and a half foot tall. Uh, flowers in late summer. It's got uh, spikes with three quarter inch uh, hot pink flowers. It grows on moist soils. I think it prefers clay over sand and it's good nectar plant. Uh, gold main tick seed. This is a semi-native. It's native to the Gulf Coast, Gulf Coast and I think the Mississippi River Basin, uh, but it's not necessarily native to South Carolina, but it has established here on Edisto Island. It's found all throughout the sort of sandy roadsides where there's moist sand. Um, it's an annual. It's about 18 inches tall. Flowers in May. It's got one inch just bright deep yellow flowers with a dark crimson center. Uh, grows on sandy soils. It's a, it's a decent nectar plant, it's not the best, and it's good volunteer. Uh, the nice thing about it is it dies back in summer, so it doesn't like take over the place. It comes up, grows, grows in spring, flowers in summer, dies back, and then comes back. So you can plant like late season, per, or um, like fall, summer perennials underneath it, low growing stuff, and this stuff will come up in spring, fill up the place, flower, be beautiful, and then come summer, you have something else come in and take over. Yero, this is one that is supposedly native to South Carolina, North Carolina. I have never seen it growing wild anywhere, um, but everyone says it's native, so I'll go with it. Uh, it's perennial, gets two to three foot tall. It's got um, flowers in mid-spring with an umbel of small white flowers. It's a fantastic pollinator plant for small insects, like flies and wasps. It's not so great for butterflies. I will see hair streaks and stuff on it occasionally, uh, but it's better for some of the smaller non-butterfly pollinators. I think it's got more pollen than nectar. Uh, and it'll grow just about anywhere. It's hard to kill. It's a great garden plant. Elliot Saster, this is a rare native to South Carolina and the North Carolina coast. It's a perennial, <coughs> three to four foot tall. Uh, flowers in early fall, late summer. It has three quarter inch aster flowers all across the plant. It grows on wet soils. It's a great nectar plant for all, all walks of pollinator. And it's potentially a host plant for the Pearl Crescent. I don't know that I don't think that's confirmed, but they do host on this genus of asters. Uh, so it's possible that they use it, but I don't seem to notice increased numbers of pearl crescents where I find this uh, instead of uh, with like some other Symphiotrichum species that wherever you see those, there's always an increase in pearl crescents. So I don't know if they host on this or not, but they could potentially. Uh, muck sunflower. This is my all time favorite. The thing I recommend for every garden down here in the Charleston area. Uh, again, this is a semi-native. It's native to the Gulf Coast. It's not native necessarily to South Carolina, but it's established all throughout the Megat Ravenel area and some parts of Edisto Island. Uh, it's often confused with uh, swamp sunflower, Helianthus angustifolius. You'll see it labeled at like, um, like hardware stores and, and um, big box stores and stuff like that. They'll sell it sometimes every once in a blue moon if they're a good place. 
but usually it's mislabeled as swamp sunflower, but it's actually Helianthus simulans, muck sunflower. Um, swamp sunflower is a native, it gets about four to five foot tall. It's got a really airy open structure. This stuff is extremely dense, spreads very aggressively. It looks nothing like it. Um, and it's from the Gulf Coast, but it's an awesome pollinator plant nonetheless. Uh, it gets absolutely massive on the right soil. It'll get up to 10 foot tall in ideal conditions. Usually it's between about five and eight foot tall. It's just covered head to toe in two to two and a half inch yellow, small sunflowers. Um, it grows pretty much in any soil. It does best on rich, moist soils, but you can put it practically anywhere that's, you know, fairly moist, uh, like drip edge of a house on a sand hill or something like that. It'll grow just fine. Uh, it spreads very aggressively. Um, if you've got ideal soil in your garden, I would recommend getting like an old cow trough with like a rusted out bottom, cut the bottom out, hammer it six inches in the ground and plant it in there. Two years of the whole thing will be full and eight foot tall. Um, something like that. You, if, if you, if you don't want it to spread, you got to partition it, um, or put it in a pot, but it will grow out the bottom of the pot and then spread as well. I, I have seen it do that. Uh, and just all around great nectar plant. Larry leaf sage. Uh, this is a small little ground cover. Um, gets 12 inches tall when it flowers, but normally it just stays right on top of the ground. Native to all of South Carolina, North Carolina. It's perennial, blooms in April. Got a spike of tubular, sort of bluish, purplish flowers. It prefers part shade, and it's a decent nectar plant. Coral bean, this is mostly found on the South Carolina coast. It's perennial. Uh, the warmer your winters, the shrubbier it will get. Um, gets up to about four foot tall. Flowers in May, it's going to spike a long tubular coral colored flowers. Uh, it's mostly for uh, hummingbirds, although I have seen larger butterflies use it occasionally. It's mostly there because it's pretty. Um, uh, prefers part shade, but it will grow in full sun. Um, and it's, again, mainly good for hummingbirds. Carolina indigo, this is native to South Carolina and the North Carolina coast. It's a perennial shrub. Dies back to the roots every year and then comes back out. The warmer your winters, the, the bigger it gets. Three to four foot tall, flowers in summer. It's got a spike at three eighths uh, flowers. Prefers part shade and it really prefers dry, sandy, well drained soil. It doesn't like moisture too much. It's an okay nectar plant. Small things use it, nothing big really uses it. And I think it might be a host for the Zoraco dusky wing, but I haven't confirmed that yet. This one's mostly in there for historical interpretation and just kind of to showcase that we do actually have a native indigo. Uh, that everyone seems to forget whenever they talk about um, cultivated indigo. Uh, Lance leaf tick seed or coreopsis uh, is native to both South Carolina and North Carolina. It's a perennial, gets a foot and a half, two foot tall, flowers in mid spring, got an inch and a quarter yellow flower, grows on practically all soils, prefers moist soils. Uh, it's, it's a pretty good nectar plant, it's not the best, uh, and it's a great volunteer. It comes back, uh, or it, it's a perennial, so it comes back year after year, but it also spreads and fills up a space pretty well. Uh, you can get this as a seed packet from any big box store too. They're really easy to get. Same goes with Black-Eyed Susan. Uh, native to both South Carolina and North Carolina. They, you can get perennial or annual varieties. It's about two foot tall. Um, flowers in May to June, has a two inch yellow flower. Grows on most soils. It'd be kind of hard to start in some soils. Some, some it's kind of hard to keep it from spreading. Uh, it's a decent nectar plant. It seems to be hit or miss with certain species. Some stuff uses it, some stuff just will not touch it. I don't know what that's about. Um, it's a good volunteer too. Frostweed, this is another fantastic one I recommend. Um, it's kind of it's kind of a weedy plant. It's native to South Carolina and a couple small isolated spots in North Carolina. It's perennial, it gets four to six foot tall, flowers in se late September to October. It's got an umbel of little half inch disorganized flowers with kind of erratic shapes and petal numbers. Uh, it grows best in slight parcel shade. If it gets morning sun, it does best, like on a tree line. And it's just an all around fantastic nectar plant for everything. Hairy leaf cup, it's another good one, native to all of South Carolina, North Carolina. It's perennial, it gets four to five foot tall. It's got a big bushy growth form. It'll grow into like a lantana size, like a big lantana size bush if you let it. Um, flowers in mid to late summer. It's got one inch yellow flowers, sort of a pale pastel. Uh, prefers part shade, but it'll grow in full sun just fine. And it's just an all around good nectar plant. And just real quick, here are some of the other great plants that you can use in the coastal plain in your gardens. Uh, I've got sort of native-ish ornamentals, stuff that's not invasive, but it's kind of iffy whether it's native or not, or at the very least, 
you can get like sort of ornamental varieties, stuff like the blazing stars and the spiderwort. Spiderworts are native, but you can get very ornamental varieties from practically any big box store if you look hard enough. Uh, so you have a lot of options there. You don't just have to go get the wild type stuff like with the other things I was showcasing. And also some other plants that are found wild at the Hutchinson House that are great nectar plants for certain um, uses and areas, but that I didn't put in the garden because I've got acres of the stuff, so it's just redundant. Um, just real quick, Lantana, absolutely unparalleled nectar source down here where I live. It, it is preferred above practically everything, uh, except for maybe zinnias and some of the other um, native plants that I have just in the, the brief period where they're blooming, but it blooms year round. It blooms in the winter um, until we get a really hard frost. It's just great for, for everything, but it can spread on sort of pasture lands. It's, I think it's native to Mexico. Uh, it's native to North America, but not really to, not to South Carolina by any means. Um, it seems to really only spread in where I've seen it on sort of like dry pasture land. Uh, not, not that major of a concern. It's a great thing to use in like a residential area. Golden canna, that's one I used in the garden. I didn't have an individual slide for that because I didn't have a photo of it. So it's here. Um, canna flaccida, golden canna is native to South Carolina to some degree. Um, it's a host plant for the Brazilian skipper. It's really hardy, grows anywhere. Um, Stokes aster, that's another one. Um, not the best nectar plant, but it's hardy, spreads well, it's small, it's compact. You can put it around things. Uh, you can get it at any big box store. Uh, blazing stars you have a lot to choose from you can go out and get wild types dig up bulbs or get seeds or you can go get like ornamental larger showier varieties uh it's great nectar plant it's got a really small footprint doesn't take up a lot of space ohio spiderwort not not a very good nectar plant but it's got a tiny footprint and you just can't kill the stuff uh you can use it to fill in gaps edge stuff add some add some variety to a to a garden um for the natives spotted bee balm Awesome, awesome pollinator plant. It's it's not the best for for some of our butterflies. I think smaller butterflies like it a lot, but bees and wasps just absolutely adore the stuff. Grows like crazy, spreads really well. It's a perennial, volunteers. It's, it's, it's really weedy looking, but if you don't mind that, it's awesome. Camphor weed, uh, this is a really hardy drought tolerant plant. It grows like on the beachfront in the dune system. You, you tolerate drought like you wouldn't believe. Uh, it's not the greatest nectar plant, uh, but it does produce nectar in good soil. Um, so it's, it's a good addition if you're trying to do like a Sarascape burn or something like that. Tall goldenrod. This is one if you're mostly if you're just kind of doing like a habitat area. Uh, I wouldn't recommend putting it in your garden because it spreads even worse than the muck sunflower. It's huge. It's a great nectar plant, but it just grows like crazy you can't once you start once it gets started you can't get rid of it pretty much uh it, it's kind of a cornerstone habitat species it will just create wildlife habitat wherever you put it whether you want it to or not um purple passion flower that should be in everybody's butterfly garden um i don't have it in mind because it's actually growing wild all over the meadow so i might bring it into the garden and put it up on the fence once i get a permanent fence or something like that but there i just didn't really see a reason to put it in the actual beds itself just because it's grown wild all over the place um, and old field aster is one that people often overlook uh, i actually have the wrong scientific name on there that's supposed to be cynthia trichum demosum not pelosum um, uh, pelosum is another one that's great but it doesn't really grow that common uh, out here in, in really sunny areas uh, i meant to put demosum there but that's what the photo is uh, it's a host for the pearl crescent it's a great nectar plant especially for pulp for small pollinators and it's very hardy and I think I'm going to call it there because I am like 10 minutes past time.